Welcome back to Quantitative Analysis and Anthropology. I'm Professor Peregrine. Today we're on topic two, lesson three. And we're going to talk about measures of central tendency. Three basic key measures of what are called location or central location. And these are absolutely basic to statistics. They are the mean, and I'm going to show it as x bar. That's a standard way of showing it. This is x, right? Bar. x bar. Some people use m. Some people use a little mu, which is a Greek letter. x bar is very widely used, and that's what I'm going to use here. The median and the mode. Three measures of location or really of central tendency, what that middle or most typical trait in a population is. Let's just move on and, and look at this. So this is the formula for the mean. Now I apologize. We had talked about not doing much math, and there's not going to be much math in here. But we're going to do some simple math. And we're going to try and do this conceptually rather than arithmetically. So. Here we go. X bar, the arithmetic mean, is the sum sigma. This is a Greek letter sigma, and it means the sum or adding up. The sum of all the x's in a population, all of the cases, divided by the number of cases. So the mean is the sum of all of the values in of all the cases in a population divided by the number of cases in that population. You probably already know this. You may not have seen this as a formula, but you probably know that. And here we have two populations. I hope you can see these well on the screen. One of them is red, and one of them is green. Both of them have the same mean. They're just spread out more. We'll talk about measures of spread in just a minute. But the mean of these two is the same, even though they look different in terms of the normal curve of their distribution. They have the same mean. They just spread more. OK, next one, the mode and the median. These are a little bit easier to understand. The mode is just simply the most frequent case. And I'm showing you this in a skewed distribution because if we go back and look at the normal distribution, the mode and mean are going to be the same, aren't they? Because the most frequent is also at the arithmetic mean in a true normal curve. So I'm showing this in a skewed distribution. Remember what this is? What direction is this skewed? That's right. It's skewed right um, or positively. So here's the mode in this distribution at the most common point. And then, or the most frequent, and then this is the median. The median requires a little bit of thinking about. It's sometimes thought of as the balance point in a distribution, if you put, if you create a distribution with little stacks of blocks or little dice, where would you have to hold that in order for it to balance? If you had it on, oh, you put it on a ruler and you use dice to create that distribution, one that looked like this, where would your finger have to be in order to balance that distribution? That's the median. And so it's simply where 50% of the cases score above that, 50% score below that. That's the median. Notice that the mode here is a little higher than the median. And we'll look at this in a minute. The mean would even be a little bit lower. OK. These two are not really arithmetically used very much. But they're used a lot to describe things because they're very useful for statistics. If we go back for descriptive statistics, we look at this curve. The mode is the same as the median. 
because this would be the balance point is the same as the mean. So for a normal curve, mean, median, and mode are all the same. And arithmetic mean is the best way to describe that. When we have a skewed distribution, then mode or median might be better to use. The mode is going to tell you the most frequent case. So if you have a skewed distribution, let's say of income, you might want to report the modal score because that's the most frequent score. Because we know there's all these very wealthy people skewing that to the right, you might want to report the most frequent score as being the average or typical. With median, that's sort of the middle. That makes a reasonable, what's typical, that's the middle. And that's why you hear the phrase median family income. So let me show you this in comparison. So here we have that distribution I showed you before, and this black line would be the mean, and the median, and the mode. The most frequent, and the middle of the distribution, 50% above it and below it, and also the arithmetic mean. Here's the mode, right? The most frequent, the median, 50% above and below. And here on that same distribution shows the mean. So you can see the mean is about here, the median is here, and the mode is here. In terms of descriptive statistics, which one of these measures of location we want to use depends on what we want to explain. And, and I, I want to make this clear in talking about statistics visually and conceptually. We use statistics as a way to describe things. Let's go back to that explanation, the, the, the issue that I had before. We want to describe income. What do we use to describe income? We know that the curve is shaped like this. It has that long tail for all of the very wealthy people. Is a typical income that income that the most people in the society have? That would be a reasonable choice. Is it the median income that is right between where 50% and 50% are, the balance point of that distribution? That might be a good choice, and in fact, that's what you often hear in terms of income. You hear median family income. That's what this is. Mean? We could use that too. That's the arithmetic average. But notice as we look at those, they skew, they, they move as the distribution skews. Here's the interesting thing. And this is one of the things we want to learn as we learn about statistics. Statistics can be used and are used just like language to argue a point. If you are someone who studies poverty and wants to make the point that there are many people living in poverty uh, or that the majority of people in society are living in poverty, you might report the mean because you're going to have much more of the distribution. If you count the number of people here, there's going to end up being more than in there. So look, at most of society lives below the mean, lives below average. Or if you wanted to say, no, there's things are equal, they're equal, or you know, you could say, no, look how much society, this many people live above the mean, or above the average, they're above typical. You can flip that around, right, and say, no, typical income in this country is here, using the mode. Typical income in this country is here, that rises typical income up higher. No, typical income in this country is here, that rises typical income e up even higher. And that's what I want you to think about with these statistics, is that these are tools that you use to make an argument. And you need to be careful about 
how people are describing things and what tools they use. You will often hear it said that the average income in the United States is something like $50,000. It's somewhere, the average family income is around 50, I think it's $57,000 this year. Average family income. Does that mean this? No. Nope. It means that. And it doesn't mean that. But depending on the argument we want to make, we might use one of these others and say average family income. Well, to be more appropriate, instead of saying average family income is $57,000, we should say median family income or mean family income, or modal family income. So it's an introduction to, to how you argue with statistics and how people are going to try and push an argument with statistics. And again, that's one of the reasons that we're, we have this class in anthropology, to help you understand arguments, critique them, and help you to make your own arguments. OK. So it's a good stopping point. We'll take a short break and come back to talk about measures of dispersion or spread. Okay, we're back. So now we're going to talk about measures of spread or dispersion in a normal distribution. And there are two of those. One of them is called the variance and it's typically shown with a V. Um, sometimes it's shown as S squared because it is the square of the standard deviation, which is usually shown by a little sigma, a lowercase Greek sigma. Sometimes the, the letters SD are put there. Um, these are two important measures of spread, but really the focus is standard deviation because standard deviation, as we'll see, is the square root of the variance. And so mostly we just talk about standard deviation. It's what's used. This is a squared value, and that's hard to work with mathematically, so standard deviation is what we will typically use. Okay, told you we weren't gonna do math. Don't be afraid. This is another formula to think about conceptually. Variance. Variance equals the sum, remember sum, of all of the scores, x, minus the mean, squared. So you take every score in a distribution, every individual score, and you subtract that score from the mean, remember the mean of the distribution, and you square it. Then you take the next score. You, add, you subtract it from the mean, and you square it. And then you divide by n. Minus 1, right? This is the number of cases minus 1. So let's think about this just for a minute. What have we got here in terms of the variance? This is a mean, isn't it? It's an average. You're summing up a bunch of stuff and dividing it by the number of cases, right? It's an average. What is it, though? It's the average amount by which any given case differs from the mean. Let me say that again. It's the average amount by which any given case differs from the mean. Keep that in mind. That's what we're looking here. Look at the formula. Sum of x over n, right? Just add that other stuff in there. It's an average. The average amount by which any given case differs from the mean. Why do we square it? Why is that mess in there? Well, if you think about it, if you subtract every case from the mean and these are negative values or positive values, you're going to end up with zero. So squaring it just helps take care of that. Um, small value minus the mean is going to be a negative number. Big value minus the mean is a big number. If you square it, it gets rid of 
that and you end up not summing to zero and so you, you end up better off with the square. Working with the square is a pain in the neck. So when we actually use it, we get rid of that by doing a square root. Why is this n minus 1? That's a little weirder. Okay. The reason for that is that there is one number in here, one place, that cannot vary, and that's the mean. A case at the mean is mean minus mean squared is 0. It, it doesn't vary. It has no variance from the mean. And that mean we always are subtracting from. So we have one fixed score, which is the mean. So we get rid of that score. This is called, as we'll talk about later, the degrees of freedom. How much do the scores in the distribution, how free are they to vary? That's the degrees of freedom. And the degrees of freedom is n minus 1. The scores can vary except for 1, which is the mean. OK? That's the variance. Think about it conceptually. Now we'll get on to the more important thing, which is standard deviation. Standard deviation is simply the square root of the variance. It's usually shown by this little lowercase sigma. But it's the same formula. And average, the average amount any given case varies from the mean. And it's just the square root of that. We got that square in there just to, to make things work better. and So it's just the square root. All right. We have two distributions shown here. We have one in green and one in red. The one in green is wider. The one in red is narrower. Think about this. The average amount by which any given case differs from the mean. The red distribution, the amount by which cases vary from the mean is less. That means the standard deviation is less. In this wider, more spread distribution, cases tend to vary from the mean more. That means the standard deviation is greater. So a narrow distribution, the standard deviation is smaller. Greater, wider distribution, the standard deviation is greater. It's that simple. If it's not that simple, rewind this and look at it again. These are key concepts that you're going to need to understand. Mean and standard deviation, which is essentially a mean itself, right? Remember that. Mean and standard deviation are two concepts you have to have crystal clear before we go further in this class, OK? I hope you do at this point. Now, to help your brains wind down a little bit, and maybe if you want to go and watch this part again, we'll take a short break and come back. And we are back. So. Hope the smoke stopped coming out of your heads and your brain is working fine after those last two bits. We're going to move on now to something that's jumping ahead. And that's OK, because I want to introduce this first, because it brings a lot of this together. We're going to talk about this another time. This is z-scores, or what are called standardized scores. And we'll get to this later on many times. A z-score. What's this? Well, that looks like an average, doesn't it? It's the value of any given case minus the mean divided by, what's that? Standard deviation. Z-score. Score on a case minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Why do we do this? What does this mean? This standardizes the scores. How? Well, basically, z 
is what we call dimensionless. It doesn't matter how this is measured. It can be measured in millimeters, it can be measured in ounces, it can be measured in just counts of something of apples. But you subtract it from the mean, divide by standard deviation, whatever those measurements are get canceled out and you have no dimension. And that means you can compare, because there's no dimensions, you can compare literally apples and oranges, or millimeters and ounces. You can look at an individual in terms of their weight and height in equivalent means, because here pounds is canceled out, here centimeters is canceled out. So this is standardized because everything's on a level playing field. Everything is measured the same way. That's why z-scores are so important. We're going to find out that these are basic to two of the key uh, tools we use, which are um, correlation coefficients and um, linear regression. I hope you can see this well enough. This is a normal curve. And what this is showing is z-scores. And this is where things get magic again. Remember, the normal curve is magical. I'm going to uh, blow this up a little bit in the hopes you can see it better. This is a normal curve, and it's showing you here the magic of the normal curve. All right. Remember already, we've got mean, median, and mode in a normal curve all in the same place. Here we have zero standard deviations from the mean. That's equivalent to a z-score of zero. We move over one standard deviation. That's equivalent to minus one z-scores down one standard deviation no matter what it is and again no matter what we're talking about inches pounds and we can compare cases on their z-scores in inches and in pounds and that's why z-scores are important they're standardized they're dimensionless minus one z-score minus one standard deviations those are equivalent and here's where the real magic comes in minus one standard deviation minus one z-score, we know by probability theory that 34.13% of the population, or basically 34% of, any, of, a, of a normally distributed population is scores between zero and minus one z-scores. Same between zero and one. So between one and minus one z-scores are 68% of the population. Given the z-score for any given individual, we can tell where they are located in a population and the probability of them being typical. Because we define in statistics uh, by convention, and it can change, that in general, a case that lies outside of two standard deviations on some score is atypical of that population. That's just a general assumption or a, a, a decision that's made by convention, but we're going to find out that varies depending on what we're talking about. 1.64, 1.96 standard deviations, but we'll just say two for now. Um, when you get to three standard deviations, three z-scores away, then you're in a situation where individual scoring here are probably not actually part of this population. They're probably part of another population. And in fact, if you get a little bit more than two z-scores away, you can pretty well assume that these individuals have, have been somehow pulled from a different population and put in here, but they're different. So if we have height, let's say, typical person is between 
minus two and two standard deviations. Gigantic basketball and football players are up there. And we could almost say they're in a population of really, really big people. We come down here in height, minus two, minus three standard deviations away from the mean, minus two or minus three Z scores away from the mean. And here we have very small people or maybe little people who are uh, dwarves or have dwarfism and so they, they really are, in terms of height, kind of a different part of the population. Um, these people might have um, extraordinary growth, hormones that have caused them extraordinary growth. So they're really, in terms of height, they're a, a different part of the population. That's what these z-scores can do for us. And, and I want to emphasize this, I'll emphasize this again. If we want to talk about people and their uniqueness, and we do, how people are unique, special individuals. We can do that with words. But think about it. When we can use numbers like this, we can tell with precision how similar they are and how different they are on different characteristics. And we can say where they stand in a population, that they are typical in one way and really unusual in another, and typical in a third and really unusual in another. And we can take anybody and looking at this use probability and say probabilistically how similar or different they are from the, the bulk of the population. To me, that's a really powerful way to be able to talk about and look at and understand diversity. And again, I want to point this out, that math, statistics, is another tool in your toolbox to talk about humans and culture. Language is a very important tool. We're trying to add an additional tool that, in my opinion, is very elegant and precise and really adds to our ability to talk about the human condition. OK, that's it for today. We'll see you later.